This first segment will establish that the papacy does, from time to time, get usurped. We will look at one specific case, that of Pope Innocent II, as it bears some parallels to what we face today. We will also examine the criteria which St. Bernard used to discern that Innocent II was indeed the true Pope. Finally, we will fast forward to the Papal Conclave of 1903, where nefarious forces almost succeeded in getting control of the Papal throne. The year is 1130 AD. The reigning Pope dies and is quickly buried. Two rival Roman families intend to put their own respective candidates on the papal throne. A new pope is elected by a group of cardinals on behalf of the first family. He takes the name Pope Innocent II. When the rival family receives word of the election, they are furious and elect one of their own with another group of cardinals. He takes the name Anacletus II. Anacletus, having more power in Rome, captures St. Peter's and the Lateran, while Pope Innocent goes into hiding. Anacletus was nearly universally accepted as Bishop of Rome until his death eight years later in 1138. Shortly after, Pope Victor IV was elected, but soon resigned after the intervention of St. Bernard, and Pope Innocent ascended to the papal throne. Eight years after his initial election, St. Bernard gave the following as to why he supported Innocent II. The life and character of our Pope Innocent are above any attack, even of his rival, while the others are not safe even from his friends. In the second place, if you compare the elections, that of our candidate at once has the advantage over the other as being pure in motive, more regular in form, and earlier in time. The last point is out of all doubt. The other two are proved by the merit and the dignity of the electors. You will find, if I mistake not, that this election was made by the more discreet part of those to whom the election of the Supreme Pontiff belongs. There were cardinals, bishops, and priests in sufficient number to make a valid election. The consecration was performed by the Bishop of Ostia, to whom that function specifically belongs. After Innocent II reclaimed the papacy at the Second Lateran Council, he annulled all the clergy ordained by Anacletus, proclaiming them schismatic and heretical. Both Anacletus II and Victor IV are considered false popes, also called antipopes, impostors who usurp the chair of Peter with the aid of men of great power and influence. The National Catholic Almanac lists 41 such false popes. Roughly one in seven of all popes was an imposter. At the 1903 papal conclave, a prelate named Cardinal Rampolla received enough votes to become pope, but to everyone at the conclave's surprise, a veto was presented on behalf of his imperial majesty, Franz Joseph of Austria, annoying the election. It turned out that Rampolla was a grand master with the OTO, an occult sect which included occultists Alistair Crowley and Rudolf Steiner. The 1903 conclave instead produced Pius X, whose pontificate was a major setback for what was known as the Rampolla clique. Following the death of Pius X, however, the lingering influence of this malignant faction resumed and strengthened. We will make note of just one member of the group, Rampola's closest friend and confidant, Bishop Radini Tedeschi, who would take a young priest by the name of Angelo Roncalli under his wing and set him on a course to the papal throne. Nearly half a billion Catholics are joined by countless numbers of other creeds in mourning Pius XII. His spiritual reign began on his 63rd birthday in 1939, on the eve of one of the world's most stormy eras, with his consecration as the 266th pontiff in the unbroken succession of the church. His was a tireless pace, even after his near-fatal illness of four years ago, to the very eve of his fatal stroke. Now his memorable reign is ended, and the world mourns a beloved and compassionate man of God.
Pope Pius XII died on October 9, 1958. His doctor, Gasparini, said afterwards, The Holy Father did not die because of any specific illness. His heart was healthy. His lungs were good. He could have lived another 20 years. Eight days later, on October 17th, Cardinal Celso Costantini, Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church, also died of heart failure, the day after declaring his desire to attend the Papal Conclave in the Sistine Chapel. The following week, another Cardinal died of what physicians thought was a heart attack. The very day he was to enter the Conclave, his name was Cardinal Mooney, Archbishop of Detroit. Here is an excerpt from the New York Times. He had lunch with Cardinal Spellman and McIntyre and appeared in good spirits when he smoked a cigar afterward. He told his secretary to call him in 25 minutes. When Monsignor Breitenbach entered the Cardinal's bedroom at 2.45 p.m., the prelate was dying. Five minutes later, he was dead. Having covered the deaths of the Pope and two cardinals in the space of 16 days, a short note on poison is in order. Poison has long been the method of choice of enemy agents operating within the Vatican. Pope Clement XIII and Pope Clement XIV were poisoned in 1769 and 1774, both after trying to rein in the Jesuit order. It is claimed that Pius XI was poisoned in retaliation for two encyclicals he had written one condemning Hitler, the other Mussolini. John Paul I is widely believed to have been poisoned in 1978 when he tried to rid the Vatican of Freemasons. Were these prelates eliminated in the same way in October 1958 in a plot to seize control of the Church? The events that transpired in the following conclave certainly make it appear so. Pius XII was an ardent foe of communism and a major stumbling block in the communist Masonic plan for world revolution. In order to achieve their aims, these subversive groups not only had to eliminate Pius XII, but also had to ensure that whoever succeeded him would soften the church's stand against communism. The man they had picked out for the job was Cardinal Angelo Roncalli of Venice, whose election to the papal throne was planned well in advance by unholy forces. Let's look at a few testimonies, starting with Franco Bellagrandi, member of the Vatican Noble Guard. Bellagrandi recounts in his book, Nikita Roncalli, an exchange he had with a high-ranking Freemason a week before the conclave. The next pope will not be Siri, as it is murmured in some Roman circles, because he is too authoritarian a cardinal. The choice has already fallen on the Patriarch of Venice, Roncalli. Chosen by whom? by our Masonic representatives in the Conclave. There are Freemasons in the Conclave? Certainly. The Church is in our hands. Next up is three-time Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti, who wrote in one of his books about being summoned by Roncalli the day before the Conclave. During their meeting, Roncalli told him that he had already been congratulated by General de Gaulle. Andriotti wrote of the meeting, I listened stupefied and embarrassed. I thus knew that Roncalli was sure of being elected by the conclave. Now we come to Cardinal Tisserand, who was Dean of the College of Cardinals at the 1958 conclave. A letter from Cardinal Tisserand to a professor teaching canon law was published in the Italian periodical Vita. Within that letter was the startling statement. The election of John the 23rd was illegitimate 
because it was willed and planned for by forces alien to the Holy Spirit. And lastly, we will present an article by journalist Elizabeth Gerstner, which appeared in a major German newspaper the morning of the conclave. The article stated in advance that it would be Cardinal Roncalli that would be elected Pope at the conclave. Thousands fill St. Peter's Square as the conclave of the College of Cardinals begins. Cardinal Tisserand, Dean of the Sacred College, leads them to the Sistine Chapel, where they are sealed off from the outside world during their deliberations until the next Pope is chosen. This is Cardinal Giuseppe Siri, Archbishop of Genoa. Cardinal Siri was the most popular cleric in Italy at the time of the conclave and the man most observers expected to be proclaimed Pope. He was also Pius XII's desired successor. Pius XII made him Archbishop of Genoa when he was 40, and made him Cardinal when he was just 47, at the time the youngest of the College of Cardinals. He was a staunch traditionalist and adamantly opposed to innovation. He is also the man many believe was the true Pope elected at the 1958 Conclave two days before Angelo Roncalli. Here is the Sistine Chapel, as set for the election of the 262nd Pontiff. Each of the 51 cardinals present occupies his throne during each... This is 77-year-old Cardinal Angelo Roncalli, a man who had been dismissed from his teaching position at the Lateran Seminary in Rome for promoting the revolutionary theories of Rudolf Steiner, he was also known to socialize frequently with high-level Freemasons, Communists, and Modernists. A man who Pius XII, at the behest of the FBI and the U.S. State Department, sent off to Venice as Archbishop in hopes to keep him out of trouble for the remainder of his life. Hardly a desirable profile for a papal candidate. Actual round of balloting. The results are signaled by this stove to the watching world. Straw from old wine boxes is mixed with the unsuccessful ballots to send up black smoke. A successful ballot will be marked by white smoke. In the square outside... What the narrator says here is not quite right. The ballots are always burned after every second balloting. When no one received enough ballots, wet straw is added to the ballots, which produces a thick, dark smoke. On the other hand, if a new pope is chosen, dry straw is added, which produces pure white smoke easily distinguishable from the first type. It's a very simple procedure. Anyone can try it themselves in their backyard. Right. Eager attention is concentrated on the thin chimney atop the Sistine Chapel to the right of St. Peter's Basilica. It is almost noon when the first puff or fumetta appears. It's white. This is the first fumetta, which appeared shortly before noon on the first day of balloting, Sunday, October 26th. The second fumetta, which we will see shortly, appeared at 5.55 p.m. and lasted a full five minutes before turning dark. It is important to note that at the previous papal conclave, which elected Pius XII, the white smoke burned for only two minutes. Excitement fills the square until the second a black puff emerges moments later. Rebuffed enthusiasm makes the deadlock of the Cardinals seem all the longer through the succeeding ballots. This footage was taken by journalist Jacques Perrault and produced and broadcast by French radio and television broadcasting. What you are seeing now is footage from the fateful Sunday evening in October 1958. Over 200,000 people are gathered in St. Peter's Square, awaiting the new Pope. Little do they know, as darkness falls on Rome, that an imposter is on hand, waiting to claim the chair of Peter.
This is the very clear emission of white smoke which lasted for five minutes. Naturally, the Cardinals and the men at the stove can hear the chorus of 200,000 voices celebrating the news. If a pope has not been elected, then it would be time to throw some wet straw into the stove and change the signal. But the white smoke persists. The announcer on Vatican Radio, Padre Pellegrino, exclaims, The smoke is white. There can be no doubt. A pope has been elected. Reports go out around the world that a new pope has been elected. Vatican officials scramble to their positions to greet the new pope. The crowd looks to the balcony, where the pope should appear within 20 minutes. But no pope appears. Later that evening, Vatican Radio announces that there had been a mistake and that no pope had been chosen. At the time of this event, it would have been inconceivable to most people that the election of a pope could be suppressed in such a way. But looking back over 50 years of destruction, many are arriving at this moment as the pivotal event in the decline of the church. The smoke signal was no mistake. Someone became pope that night. The subsequent question is, who was it? As mentioned before, Cardinal Siri was the man most people thought would succeed Pope Pius XII. We will now turn to two other sources who claim that Cardinal Siri became Pope that evening. Our first source is FBI consultant Dr. Paul L. Williams. Williams quotes two State Department declassified files in his book, The Vatican Exposed. In 1958, when the Cardinals were locked away in the Sistine Chapel to elect a new pope, mysterious events began to unfold. On the third ballot, Siri, according to FBI sources, obtained the necessary votes and was elected as Pope Gregory XVII. On the next page, Williams continues. On the fourth ballot, according to FBI sources, Siri again obtained the necessary votes and was elected Supreme Pontiff. But the French cardinals annulled the results, claiming that the election would cause widespread riots and the assassination of several prominent bishops behind the Iron Curtain. The next source is best-selling author, Jesuit, and former papal advisor, Father Malachi Martin. In an interview in the late 90s, Father Martin was asked if there was any truth to the rumors that Cardinal Siri was elected pope. Father Martin gives a very frank response. The truth is, he got sufficient votes twice to become Pope in two conclaves, but he refused it. At least two, if not three, but he refused it. And he made quite clear, talking to us after those two conclaves, that yes, the votes were there, but he refused to take them. He refused to take them. When the interviewer asks why Siri refused, Martin says, I think mainly out of fear. I think his family was at stake. He was a Genovese Gen family. They were fishermen originally, very extensive family. And um, he, he felt that there was too much physical and social danger for his family if he bucked the system. And remember that the two, the two uh, conclaves I'm talking about is the conclave of 1958, which elected John XXIII, and the conclave of June 1963, which elected Paul VI. And there are very political conflicts. The interviewer then asks if Siri refused because he thought he could not be an effective pope. No, no, he felt that they wouldn't let him live. They were bent. Remember, the whole, the whole thing was planned. They were, they were bent on changing the church. And they weren't going to allow Siri in because everybody knew what Siri would do. He'd simply put on his uh, coat mail, he'd put on, take his back legs and go out and cut off heads. Siri would not make a compromise. So I think that uh, he said, no, I can't do that because my family will suffer. And he has a large family. So he wouldn't do it. The whole thing was planned. 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 The conclave of cardinals has reached an agreement. The ancient signal to the world comes from the Sistine Chapel. Habemus Papam. We have a Pope in the traditional phrase of centuries. 
the throngs who have waited in the square of St. Peter's rejoice with half a billion Catholics around the world. Elevated to the papacy, Angelo Giuseppe Cardinal Roncalli, shortly before his 77th birthday. Chosen after one of the shortest electoral conclaves in 600 years, he will reign as Pope John the 23rd, the first pontiff to assume the name John since the 14th century. By the time the new head of the church appeared on the balcony of St. Peter's, one of the greatest crowds in Vatican history, over 400,000, jam the square, with traffic snarled for miles around by those hurrying to be present. One of his first acts as Pope was to deliver an appeal for world peace, this being after his initial appearance, and delivery of the papal benediction to the throngs present to acclaim him. Pope John XXIII was born Angelo Roncalli in 1881, fourth in a peasant family of 14 in a small village in Bergamo, Italy. When Roncalli was 19, still too young to be ordained, he received a scholarship to study in Rome. During his first semester, he became friends with another student named Ernesto Buonati. Buonati would later assist in Roncalli's first mass and the two would remain close friends throughout their lives. Unfortunately, Buonati was one of the leading modernists in Italy. He was excommunicated three times. The third and final time, he was personally excommunicated by the Pope. When Roncalli was 24, he became personal secretary to Bishop Radini Tedeschi. Tedeschi, as you will recall, was close friend and confidant of Cardinal Rampolla. Tedeschi was expected to become Secretary of State when Rampolla became Pope. But Rampolla didn't become Pope. Pius X did. And soon after, Rampolla resigned, and Bishop Tedeschi was sent packing by the new Pope to Bergamo. From Bergamo, he would develop his protege, Roncalli, who would one day succeed where Rampolla failed. In 1913, the Holy Office put Father Roncalli, now a seminary lecturer, under observation for his unorthodox views and suspected modernism. In 1924, Father Roncalli began to lecture at the Lateran Seminary in Rome, but was abruptly relieved of his duties three months later for drawing from the occult philosophies of Rudolf Steiner. You will remember that Steiner was a member of the OTO and a close associate of Helena Blavatsky, founder of the Theosophical Society. Roncalli was kept under close scrutiny by the Holy See, as well as the CIA and the FBI, until his papal election in 1958. Upon his election, Roncalli would take the name John XXIII. This would not seem unusual to the average person. However, there was in fact another very infamous papal imposter named John XXIII, who reigned from 1410 to 1415. So infamous, in fact, that no pope had chosen the name John in well over 500 years. Hardly a name a man with known connections to modernism and the occult would choose to quell scrutiny. Maybe this name was meant to tell us something. Pope John XXIII's first act as pope was to make 23 new cardinals, among them his close friend Giovanni Montini, who Pius XII refused to make cardinal for reasons we will discuss later. Montini would become Pope Paul VI in 1963. On January 25, 1959, three months into his pontificate, John XXIII announced that he would call an ecumenical council, telling friends he was spontaneously inspired. It would become known as Vatican II, the disastrous effects of which will need to be left for another movie. Let it suffice to quote Cardinal Siri, who called it the greatest mistake in history. During his pontificate, John XXIII began introducing small, seemingly insignificant changes to the Mass. For instance, adding the name of St. Joseph to the canon. Changes that, in hindsight, appear to be acclimating the faithful to changes in the liturgy. Changes that would culminate in the complete destruction of the Tridentine Latin Mass in 1969. According to canon law, 
Those who join Freemasonic secret societies lose their membership in the Catholic Church. Those who join Masonic sects or other societies of the same sort, which plot against the Church or against legitimate civil authority, incur ipso facto an excommunication Milanese journalist Pierre Carpi claims to have absolute proof that while Roncalli was in Istanbul as apostolic delegate, he was instituted into the 18th or Rosicrucian degree of Freemasonry. He gives plenty of details in his book The Prophecies of John the Twenty-Third, including the fact that Roncalli took the name Johannes at his initiation. So, when Roncalli took the name John as Pope, was he sending a little message to his Masonic brethren they had captured the papacy? After his posting to Paris, members of the Presidential Guard Republicaine reported that Roncalli, dressed in street clothes, regularly attended the Thursday evening meetings of the Grand Orient Masonic Lodge. Several high-ranking Freemasons had some interesting things to say about Pope John XXIII. The sense of universalism that is rampant in Rome is very close to our purpose of existence. With all our hearts, we support the revolution of John the Twenty-Third. Eve Marcedon, 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason. I know Cardinal Roncalli very well. He is a deist and a rationalist, whose strength did not lie in the ability to believe in miracles and to venerate the sacred. High-ranking Freemason, Carl Jacob Burkhardt. To put Pope John XXIII's actions regarding communism in perspective, it will do well to look at these statistics from the United States House Judiciary Committee. Between 1917 and 1959, the number of Catholics murdered by Soviet regimes breaks down like this. 2.5 million faithful, 12,800 priests and monks, 55 bishops, imprisoned or deported, 10 million faithful, 32,000 priests, 199 bishops. In addition, roughly 16,000 priests were forced to abandon the priesthood. Nearly 32,000 churches and seminaries were closed, and all Catholic organizations were dissolved. With that information firmly planted in your mind, try to comprehend the following facts about John the Twenty-Third. On his 80th birthday, John the Twenty-Third received a telegram from the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev congratulating him and wishing him good health and success in his noble aspirations for peace on Earth. On March 6, 1963, John the Twenty-Third received Nikita Khrushchev's son-in-law and daughter at the Vatican in a private meeting arranged by Italian Communist Party Secretary Palmiro Togliatti. This well-publicized visit earned the Communist Party in Italy an extra million votes in the national election. John XXIII also invited Communist observers to attend the Second Vatican Council with the solemn promise that there would be no criticism of Communism. And, in fact, those fathers that did attempt to do so were politely told to sit down and be quiet. Here is just one of John XXIII's favorable remarks towards Communism. I see no reason why a Christian could not vote for a Marxist if he finds the latter to be more fit to follow such a political line and historical destiny. French Communist Party leader Maurice Therese sent a glowing report about Roncalli to the Kremlin. Roncalli was an ideal prelate. He understood Marxism like a Marxist. And if the Communist Party had not been sponsoring a program of militant atheism, he might have been the best Christian comrade in the Roman Catholic Church. After his death, John XXIII's body was injected with 10 liters of embalming fluid to neutralize any decay by Gennar Goglia and his colleagues. His body was also covered with wax. Patient and prayerful crowd waits in St. Peter's Square 
as the cardinals of the Catholic Church in solemn conclave cast their fifth ballot for a successor to Pope John. Then, puffs of white smoke from a stove in the Sistine Chapel. A pope has been elected. The burning ballots signal the joyous news. When the word spread through Rome like wildfire, St. Peter's Square was filled with cheering crowds within moments. There's rejoicing throughout the world. Inside the Sistine Chapel, one seat is vacant, the one that was occupied by Giovanni Battista Cardinal Montini. He now reigns as the 261st successor to St. Peter. In papal robes, the new pontiff announces he will take the name of Paul VI. Obviously, if Cardinal Siri was elected pope at the 1958 conclave, he would have remained the true pope until his death in 1989, unless he went through a very formal and public resignation of his office. Therefore, any conclave following his 1958 election would be unlawful, and anyone else claiming to be the Pope would be an imposter. Regardless, the 1963 conclave took place, and a new man was pronounced Pope. However, Father Malachi Martin again testifies in his book, The Keys of This Blood, that Cardinal Siri was nominated and elected again in 1963 but was forced aside by what has been called the Little Brutality. He was close to his predecessor, Pope John, and is quick to announce that he will continue that pontiff's progressive policies. The new pope's first public appearance is to impart the blessing Orbi et Orbi to the city and to the world. The new pontiff was the first cardinal created by Pope John, and as Pope Paul, he is going to continue the ecumenical council. Thus, the new spiritual leader of a half billion Catholics pledges to make his church a dynamic force in the manner of Pope John XXIII. Before moving on to the section on Pope Paul VI, let us reflect briefly on the success of these progressive policies while comparing the church in 1963 to what it's become. Since Vatican II, it is estimated that 100,000 priests have left the priesthood. In 1965, over 1,575 new priests were ordained in the United States. In 2002, the number was 450. Between 1965 and 2002, the number of seminarians dropped from 49,000 to 4,700, a decline of over 90%, and two-thirds of the 600 seminaries that were operating in 1965 have now closed. In 1965, there were 180,000 Catholic nuns. By 2002, that had fallen to 75,000. In 1965, there were 104,000 teaching nuns. Today, there are only 8,200, a decline of 94%. Almost half of all Catholic high schools in the United States have closed since 1965. The annual number of marriage annulments rose from 338 in 1968 to 50,000 in 2002. Only 10% of lay religious teachers now accept church teaching on contraception. 53% believe a Catholic can have an abortion and remain a good Catholic. 65% believe that Catholics may divorce and remarry. 77% believe that one can be a good Catholic without going to Mass on Sundays. By one New York Times poll, 70% of all Catholics in the age group 18 to 44 believe the Eucharist is merely a symbolic reminder of Jesus. In 1963, abortion was illegal, motion pictures were wholesome, pornography was rare, and homosexuality was nearly unheard of. Are these not the social ills that the church is meant to guard against? How is it that we have lost every battle since 1963? How is it that every measurable indicator shows the church is in rapid disintegration? Indeed, if the progressive policies of John the 23rd and Paul the 6th were meant to strengthen and expand the Roman Catholic faith, their failure is beyond comprehension. However, it is far more likely that these reforms were a resounding success, and they did exactly what they were intended to do, destroy the Holy Roman Catholic Church.
This section would have been impossible to make without Randy Engel's 1,300-page expose of the homosexual colonization of the Catholic Church. Paul VI was born Giovanni Battista Montini in 1897. His parents were well-to-do leftists. His father was editor of a Catholic newspaper. His mother was of noble birth and a political activist. He had a sheltered childhood due to frequent bouts of illness. He is described as being a shy and melancholic boy. He was first enrolled at a traditional Jesuit school, but at the age of 14 was removed to be tutored at home. He entered the seminary at the age of 19. Because of the war, he did not experience the normal vigors of seminary life. He received one dispensation to live at home and another dispensation from wearing a cassock. While in the seminary, he read books by Oscar Wilde at a time when the artist's works were difficult to obtain, and the artist himself was heavily associated in the public mind with sodomy. After being ordained, his parents pulled some strings to get him out of a parish assignment and into the diplomatic service in Rome. As a result, he never spent so much as a day as a parish priest before becoming Pope. In Rome, he was despised openly by many of the old guard, but was also protected by certain influential individuals. He had little or no spiritual life, and a particular aversion to the rosary. At this point, we will digress to tell two other stories that coincide with Paul VI rise to the papacy. A bright young Catholic woman named Bella Dodd was recruited into the Communist Party USA in New York in the 1920s. She obtained her law degree and eventually became head of the New York State Teachers Union, as well as a high-ranking official within the Communist Party. In 1949, after 21 years as a member, she was expelled from the party. A few years later, she met with Bishop Fulton J. Sheen and was received back into the Catholic Church. Shortly after her return to the church, she testified before the United States Senate, detailing the communist infiltration of labor unions and educational institutions. She also claims that in the 1930s, that the party put 1,100 men, men without faith and without morals, into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within. The idea was for these men to be ordained and then climb the ladder of influence and authority as monsignors and bishops. Even more shocking, she claimed that when she was an active party member, she dealt with no fewer than four cardinals that were working for the communists. She emphasized that the communists knew that the only power that could destroy them was the Catholic Church, and they were determined to undermine it. It's also known that the Soviets were experts on how to recruit, blackmail, and control sexual deviants and use them for subversion. They kept a large stable of highly trained homosexual agents, whose very targets included foreign diplomats. It has been reported by communist defectors that in the early 1930s, Soviet ambassador to England, Ivan Maisky, proposed a plan to Joseph Stalin to recruit upper-class Englishmen before they entered the corridors of power. They began recruiting members from England's two most elite universities, Cambridge and Oxford. The plan turned out to be an enormous success. The Soviet's A-team became known as the Cambridge Five, Anthony Blunt, Guy Burgess, Don McLean, and Kim Philby, while the fifth man's identity is disputed. All were sodomites who operated in elite homosexual circles in London. The first man, Anthony Blunt's closest confidant and lover, Peter Montgomery, and his brother Hugh Montgomery, were also members of this elite homosexual clique. Hugh Montgomery, according to another member of the homosexual circuit, while a young diplomat working under the British representative to the Vatican, claimed to have been lovers with a certain Monsignor Montini. Montgomery later converted to Catholicism and was ordained a priest. This raises the question of whether Montini was being blackmailed by the Soviets which leads us to a former member of the Vatican Noble Guard, Franco Bellagrande. 
In his book, Nikita Roncalli, he writes that while Montini was Secretary of State, he was found out to be providing names to the Soviets of priests operating behind the Iron Curtain. According to Belagrande, Pius XII launched a secret investigation and a collection of papers was found, attributed to Montini that signaled to the KGB the names and the movements of the priests, who in those years exercised covertly their ministry amongst the oppressed populations of the communist countries. As the priests crossed over the Russian border, the Soviet secret police were on hand, and the priests were either shot or sent to the Gulag. Upon reading the papers, Pius XII collapsed and remained in bed for many days. He immediately removed Montini as Secretary of State, and assigned him as Archbishop of Milan. In Milan, the allegations of sodomy would continue. There are several reports that the local police picked up Montini dressed in street clothes for soliciting a male prostitute. In 1976, a well-known homosexual activist publicly accused Montini of having an affair with a young man named Paul while he was Archbishop of Milan. The accusations were published in prominent Italian newspapers. Members of Vatican security also claimed that while Montini was Pope, his friend Paul, an actor, had free access to the pontifical apartments and was seen taking the elevator at night. In 1984, New York Times press correspondent Paul Hoffman gives the name of Paul VI actor boyfriend. His name was Paul Carlini and can be seen here cutting Audrey Hepburn's hair in the film Roman Holiday. One cannot help but contemplate in horror whether Paul VI chose his papal name in honor of his homosexual lover, Paul. Allegations emerged again in 1993 when John Paul II tried to canonize Paul VI. The Abbe de Nantes addressed him. So, after the scandal of the election of an avowed homosexual to the throne of St. Peter, having poisoned the church, you, Most Holy Father, would have him relive and gain strength by having this same wretch of a Paul VI raised to the altars, and his bones offered as relics to the faithful for their pious kisses, and his tormented face presented to their fervent gaze in Bernini's Gloria. Ah, no, that is impossible. It will not be. Montini also moved his fellow sodomites into key positions in the church, while at the same time he gutted the curia of traditional clergy by instituting a mandatory retirement. And what was the result when word went out across underground homosexual networks that one of their own had been placed on the papal throne? They entered the seminaries in droves, to the point where today, masculine men with genuine vocations are selectively weeded out via psychological profiling, or forced to remain in the closet for fear of offending their homosexual superiors. If anyone doubts this, I suggest getting hold of the book, Goodbye Good Men, How the Catholic Church Turned Away Two Generations of Vocations from the Priesthood, by Michael S. Rose. For those who are still unconvinced that the Church has been hijacked, we will focus on a crime now in which there is no lack of proof a crime which there can be no excuse or defense, a crime that continues to be perpetrated in full light of day in every Catholic church where the phony 1969 Mass is celebrated. That crime is the destruction of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The information from this section is based largely from the 90-page book The Problems with the New Mass by Rama Kumara Swami. The Mass that is performed at the average Catholic Church on a Sunday morning is an invention of a man named Annabel Benini and instituted by Pope Paul VI on April 3, 1969. In contrast, the Tridentine Latin Mass has been in use from at least the 4th century, but could very well be apostolic in origin. In 1962, some alarming changes were made but the 1962 Mass still bore some resemblance to the Tridentine Rite. Then, in 1969, came what is known as the Nuvis Ordo Mass. This new Mass was altogether different and infinitely inferior to the Tridentine Rite. In fact, it is fair to claim that it is not a Mass at all, at least not a Catholic Mass. 
The 1969 Mass was instituted in complete violation of Pope Pius V's papal bull, Quo Primum Tempore. In 1570, Pope Pius V codified the oldest known rite in existence and banned all rites less than 200 years old under the threat of imprisonment, therefore explicitly establishing the Tridentine Rite as the normative rite of the Catholic Church. In the Mass, bread and wine are consecrated into the body and blood of Jesus Christ and offered to God in remission for sins. Attending the Mass, we witness the true presence of Jesus Christ on the altar. Protestant theology specifically rejects both the sacrificial nature of the Mass and the true presence of Jesus Christ on the altar. Protestant reformer Martin Luther particularly despised the sacrificial aspect of the Mass. In his own words, The Mass is not a sacrifice. Call it benediction, Eucharist, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, memory of the Lord, or whatever you like just so long as you do not dirty it with the name of a sacrifice. In the 1969 Mass, the explicit sacrificial nature of the Mass is absent. It was removed to make Catholic worship practices acceptable to Protestants. Sound unbelievable? Here is Pope Paul VI posing with the six Protestant ministers, who along with Annibal Bonini helped him render Catholic worship acceptable to Protestants. Archbishop Benini was also a high-ranking Freemason. He was eventually banished to Iran, where he wrote his memoirs, The Reform of the Liturgy. Between 60% and 80% of the traditional Mass was deleted. A look through any pre-1962 Missal will attest to that. For brevity, we will focus on two items, starting with the first offertory prayer, where the priest unveils the chalice, takes the gold-plated paten, with the host of unleavened bread, lifts it up to his heart, and says, Kumara Swami writes in regard to this prayer, What a marvel of doctrinal exactitude! Along with the actions of the priest, this prayer makes it clear that what is offered at the Mass is the spotless host, or victim. Second, the atoning nature of the Mass is explicit. It is offered for our sins. Third, it reminds us that the Mass is offered for the living and the dead. And fourth, that it is the priest who offers the sacrifice as a mediator between man and God. In the 1969 Mass, this prayer has been entirely deleted. In fact, of the twelve offertory prayers in the traditional Mass, only two remain. And the prayers that were removed are the same prayers that Luther removed. Second, we will deal with the most sacred part of the Mass, the canon. The canon of the Mass remained completely unchanged for over 1,300 years, until John XXIII added the name of St. Joseph. It is important to note that in 1815, there was a similar movement inaugurated among the clergy and lady to add St. Joseph's name to the canon. Hundreds of thousands of petitions were sent to Rome, but the Congregation of Rites denied the request. The real reason behind this seemingly innocent addition was to break open the canon of the Mass so the revolutionaries could get at the very words of consecration. According to sacramental theology, Proper form and proper matter are needed for a sacrament to be valid. Form is the proper words to be used by the minister. The form of the consecration of the traditional Mass has been fixed since apostolic times. In fact, one of the documents printed in front of every edition of the traditional Roman altar missal is the bull of Pope St. Pius V, entitled De Defectibus, which states in part, if anyone removes or changes anything in the form of the consecration of the body and blood, and by this change of words, does not signify the same thing as these words do, he does not confect the sacrament. The words of consecration of the bread are,
and the consecration of the wine. The Catechism of the Council of Trent states, Of this form, no one can doubt. However, in the 1969 Mass, the words of the consecration of the wine are changed from, It will be shed for you and for many, to, It will be shed for you and for all. The excuse given for this mistranslation was that there was no Aramic word for all a falsity propagated by the Protestant scholar Joachim Jeremias, and one which has been repeatedly exposed. Moreover, of the various mass rites which the Church has traditionally always recognized as valid, some 76 different rites in many different languages, not one has ever used all in the form of the consecration of the wine. The conclusion is inescapable. The form has been changed. The sacrament is not valid. One traditional Catholic author wrote recently regarding the use of English in the Mass. Most people are ignorant of the fact that no significant religion, with the exception of the Protestant sects, fundamentally uses a vulgar tongue in its worship of Almighty God. Buddhists use classical Chinese, not modern Chinese. Hindus use Sanskrit, a classical language of 2,500 years ago. Jews use Biblical Hebrew, not modern Hebrew. The Eastern Catholic Church uses Biblical Greek, not Modern Greek. The Western Catholic Church uses Latin. All are essentially non-vernacular languages. Former editor of the Universe of London, now famous for exposing the myth of man-made global warming, Lord Christopher Monckton, informs us that in the 1969 Mass, there are over 400 mistranslations from the Latin. The errors display a common theme, which reveals the intentions of the translators. That theme is the dilution or removal of allusions and references to those doctrines of the Mass, which are distinctively Catholic. We will leave this segment with some words by Martin Luther. When the Mass has been overthrown, I think we shall have overthrown the papacy. I think it is upon the Mass that the papacy wholly rests. Everything will, of necessity, collapse when their sacrilegious and abominable mass collapses. Pope Paul VI died on August 6, 1978. On August 26, Cardinal Albino Luciani was elected Pope. He took the name John Paul I. John in honor of John XXIII, and Paul in honor of Paul VI. He was an ardent feminist and was known to refer to God publicly in the feminine. He refused to be crowned pope and planned to melt down the papal tiara and sell it for the poor. He also planned something else no one expected. He planned to rid the Vatican hierarchy of members of the P2 Masonic Lodge by appointing them to obscure posts in far-off lands. His big mistake was meeting the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Vilo, also pegged for dismissal, to discuss the plans. The fateful meeting is recounted briefly in this Italian documentary, The Last Days of John Paul I. Alle 18.30 arriva nell'appartamento il segretario di Stato, Jean Villot. Si intrattiene con il Papa più di un'ora. All'ordine del giorno, sembra, nomine, spostamenti, sostituzioni. Sembra ci sia un franco scambio di opinioni. The next morning at 4.30 a.m., the Pope was discovered dead by his housekeeper, Sister Vizenza, on the 33rd day of his pontificate. She summoned the Secretary of State, Cardinal Villo, who upon entering the room, removed a bottle of medication that was next to the Pope's bed, as well as the Pope's final will and a recently drawn up document detailing who would be purged from the hierarchy. These items would never be seen again. Cardinal Villot proceeded to have the Pope's body embalmed so that no autopsy could be done. 
He then lied about virtually every aspect of the event and would meet his own death only six months later. And what does this have to do with Cardinal Siri? It shows that criminal elements are so entrenched in the Vatican that it is virtually impossible for a real pope to ascend to the papal throne and do what needs to be done. It also gives us an indication of how long Cardinal Siri would have lived had he taken office and tried to clean house and restore the church. Which brings us to our next subject, the October 1978 conclave, where Cardinal Siri is elected again and put under duress, and the exclusive interview he gave on the eve of the conclave, detailing what he would do if elected. In October 1978, 20 years after he was first elected Pope and prevented from exercising his office, Cardinal Siri will enter the conclave for the fourth and final time. In the days leading up to the conclave, Cardinal Siri is portrayed negatively in the media. It is repeatedly reported to an emotional public that he criticized the recently deceased Pope John Paul I. With major publications like Time and Newsweek joining in on cue, one has to wonder how organized and powerful a force it was that wished to prevent Cardinal Siri from taking the papal chair and restoring order in the church. Apparve e scomparve come un richiamo di Dio. Ma visse un dramma. Then, on the eve of the conclave, Cardinal Siri gave an exclusive interview to a reporter from the Turin newspaper. The reporter agreed not to run the story until after the conclave was over. However, the story appeared on the front page of the newspaper the following morning and was delivered to each of the cardinals before they entered the conclave. The opening paragraph of the article explained what Cardinal Siri intended to do if elected, revoke the disastrous changes of John XXIII and Paul VI. After the conclave, it was widely reported that it had been this interview that prevented Siri from becoming Pope and cleared the way for the election of John Paul II. But was it really? Abemus Papam! Sancte Hermane Ecclesiae Cardinalem more revelation on the extent to which a Siri papacy was sabotaged was given by Vatican insider Malachi Martin in one of his final interviews. In the interview, Father Martin was asked about who else could have been elected instead of John Paul II, and the audience is treated to a most shocking reply. Instead of John Paul II, he had the choice of Cardinal Siri of Genoa, mm -hmm. who would have done exactly what I'm to say I would do. And he was elected Pope. He got the votes in the same conclave in October 1978. And he was told by a little handwritten note that if he accepted, he would die, that his family would die. So he refused the pontificate. After the conclaves, it is known that Cardinal Siri was approached on at least two occasions and asked whether he was elected Pope. The first instance took place on May 18, 1985, when French Catholic writer Louis Hubert Remy, along with two associates, met with Cardinal Siri for a two-hour conversation. Remy recounts the meeting in an article. Of concern to us, as arranged the evening before, was to speak, first of all, about rumors that Cardinal Tisserant had left the conclave. When we recalled this fact, the reaction of Cardinal Siri was clear, precise, firm, and unquestionable. No, no one left the conclave, responded Cardinal Siri. Some moments later, when we asked him whether he had been elected Pope, his reaction was completely different. He started by remaining silent for a long time, then raised his eyes to heaven with an appearance of suffering and pain and weighing each word with gravity, said, I am bound by the secret. Then, after a long silence, he said again, I am bound by the secret. This secret is horrible. I would have books to write about the different conclaves. Very serious things have taken place, but I can say nothing. 
What is important to note here is that Cardinal Siri responded very directly to the first question about the conclave. Then, when asked if he was elected pope, responds, I am bound by the secret. But why not just respond, no, I was never elected pope? Surely, if he was not elected pope, there would be no harm in stating so. The second meeting that we know of took place on June 13, 1988. A Vietnamese priest named Father Cote traveled to Genoa to visit Cardinal Siri on behalf of a group of Catholics from Texas with the intention of asking him if he was elected pope. After locating Cardinal Siri, Father Cote asked him if he had been elected pope. Cardinal Siri said no at least twice. Then Father Cote added some pressure, telling Siri that if he had done his job, his family would not have been killed by the communist. At this point, Siri became stricken, and Father Cote asked him more explicitly, You are the pope, not the recognized pope, but the lawful pope. To which Siri responded, You already know it. This answer will call to mind the words of Christ when asked by Pilate if he was the king of the Jews, to which Christ responded, Thou sayest it. We will now try to break down the elements of this 30-year period to arrive at a conclusion regarding the papal election of Cardinal Giuseppe Siri. On the evening of Sunday, October 26th, at the 1958 conclave, an unambiguous five-minute signal indicated that a pope had been chosen. We are supposed to believe that this was a mistake, that men who operated this level in the church hierarchy could make a blunder of this magnitude in a straightforward and simple procedure. Angelo Roncalli, who became pope two days after this event, upon his election, put the church on a well-designed long-range plan to destruction. Again, we are supposed to believe that this was done by mistake. Moreover, as we covered in Part 3, there are several people who knew that Cardinal Roncalli would become Pope before the 1958 conclave, which shows that the whole thing was planned long in advance. In light of this, it isn't hard to conclude that the white smoke of Sunday evening was intended as such, and that the true Pope was elected that night. So, who was it? There are two separate individuals, one with a background in intelligence, the other a Jesuit and formal papal advisor, who were on record saying it was Cardinal Siri who was elected Pope at this conclave. There is also Cardinal Siri's indirect admission on two occasions that he was elected Pope. In addition, Cardinal Siri's success at the next three conclaves, his adherence to church traditions of the last 2,000 years, and his published remarks that he would condemn Vatican II indicate that it was indeed Cardinal Siri who was elected, as opposed to any other candidate. Furthermore, it is important to note that the white smoke is never released unless the candidate has previously accepted the office, has taken his papal name, and has begun to receive the obeisances of the cardinals there present. This means that once a man has been elected, the only way he cannot be a pope is if he goes through a very formal, public resignation of his office, or dies. If, after his election, he is then threatened or otherwise coerced into attempting to resign his office, that resignation is absolutely null and void, and he remains the true pope. Thus, beyond a reasonable doubt, Cardinal Siri was the man elected Pope on Sunday, October 26, 1958, and remained Pope until his death on May 2, 1989. And this concludes the presentation on Cardinal Giuseppe Siri. Perhaps more will come to light as more people learn about these events. Perhaps one day it will be recognized universally that Cardinal Siri was in fact the true Pope and the last five popes and all their innovations and heresies will be thoroughly condemned forever.
Now that you understand what has happened to the Roman Catholic Church, you can start to become reacquainted with the Catholic faith of nearly 2,000 years. Here are some simple steps that will get you back on track. First, the Rosary. Frequent reciting of the Rosary will strengthen your faith, eliminate sin, and fill your heart with grace. Next, the Catechism of Pope Pius X. This simple and clear question-and-answer form of catechism was used to instruct millions of new converts, as well as several generations of schoolchildren, on the basics of the Catholic faith. This document can be found easily online. Number 3. A Pre-1962 Missal Father Stedman's Sunday Missal or St. Andrew's Daily Missal are excellent books that will explain the traditional Mass. Finally, you will need to find a chapel where a validly ordained priest says the Tridentine Latin Mass. Whether priests ordained in the new rite of ordination are valid is for the experts to determine, but preference should be given to priests ordained before 1969 or in the old rite by traditional Catholic bishops. To find a traditional parish near you, you will need the traditional Latin Mass directory, which you can find at this website. We will end this film with a word on activism. If you have seen this film and understand what has happened to the church, you are obliged to do what you can to get the word out. Here are a few things you can do. Take an ad out in the newspaper explaining that there is a meeting for those who wish to find out what went wrong with the Catholic Church. Have this film played in an independent movie theater. Burn multiple copies of this DVD and hand them out to people as they come out of Mass on Sunday morning. Or better yet, give them a little gift on their windshield. And finally, always be ready to offer the traditional Catholics challenge. We are what you once were. We believe what you once believed. We worship as you once worshipped. If you were right then, we are right now. If we are wrong now, you were wrong then.